All right, everybody, welcome back to Calculus 3. Um, so, so far in this section, we've been learning about derivatives of multivariable functions. And we do so, we take derivatives in the form of partial derivatives, where we see the rate of change uh, if we change x but hold everything else constant, or maybe we change y and hold all the other variables constant. And we could also do a similar thing for functions of more than two variables as well. Um, but the thing is, so we, we know how to find the rate of change in the x direction, that's the x partial derivative, and we know how to do it in the y direction, but what if we're moving along our surface in a direction that's not just x or not just y? What if it's a little bit of both? How are we supposed to figure out the rate of change in that direction? Well, this is where the, um, the directional derivative comes in. And this is also where we're going to start using a lot of uh, what we learned in the first section, a lot of uh, what we use with... Um, with vectors. In particular, we're gonna be using, today we're gonna to be using the dot product, and we're also going to be using direction vectors or unit vectors. And we want them to be unit vectors. We want them to be magnitude one, so they don't change the size of the derivative that we're looking at. We only wanna have direction involved with the vector. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to take the derivative, but we're gonna do it in an arbitrary direction u hat, where we have u hat is u1, u2. And it's, like I said, this needs to be a unit vector so it doesn't affect the size of the overall derivative here. Okay, so how do we get a derivative in an arbitrary direction u? Well, we have something called the directional derivative. If we wanna find the rate of change of f at a particular point when we move in a certain direction, so these don't need to be the same thing, then what is this gonna be? Well, it's, just like all other derivatives we've seen, it's gonna be a limit. So the limit is h goes to zero of f of a plus u1h, and then we have b plus u2h minus f of a b divided by h. So this looks an awful lot like the, um, the partial derivative formula we have up here, except now we have a little bit of h in the x-coordinate and a little bit of h in the y-coordinate. And how much do we have in each? Well, let's say our direction is more pointing in the x direction than the y. So this will be bigger than this number. Then our h is mostly going to change the x coordinate, but it will also change the y coordinate a little bit. So effectively what we're doing is we're weighting our change based on which direction we're going in. So we have u1h and then u2h right here. All right, now in particular, um, the directional derivative is actually, or the, the partial derivatives we've already seen are actually a special case of the directional derivative. So for example, let's say I'm only moving in the i hat direction or one zero, what's a simpler way of writing the directional derivative in that direction? That's right, it's gonna be partial f partial x. Because if we're only moving in the x direction, well, that's literally what we called um, the partial derivative with respect to x. And you see here, we effectively have our one times an h and then a zero times the h for the y. All right, and then I bet you could probably guess what this is gonna be if we're only moving in the y direction. Well, our directional derivative is just gonna simplify down to partial f, partial y. So the main usage of the directional derivative is, is not in one of these special cases when we want a little bit of moving in each direction. All right, so let's kind of get a picture of this. And the picture, the, the graphical interpretation of this is gonna be remarkably similar to that of the partial derivative because this formula is very similar to the partial derivative. So this, this thing right here, this sort of blob, is going to be our surface. And let's say we want to figure out the rate of change at this input point, a, b. So we're inputting this into our function and we want to know how much our function is changing in this direction. So what we do is we make a plane in that direction that includes that unit vector. So we make this plane and we effectively take a slice out of this surface right here. So here's the surface and its intersection with the plane we just drew. Now what the directional derivative represents is you could probably guess any derivative at some level represents the slope of a tangent line. And what tangent line does this represent or slope of represent? It's going to be this one right here that's inside the plane that we drew. Now, this is very similar to how the partial derivatives were defined a few lessons ago. Only the, <coughs> excuse me, only those planes were either 
just the y z plane or in the x equals zero or a particular value, or they were parallel to the z x plane. So they are either perfectly left right or perfectly uh, back and forth. But now we can have these diagonally uh, diagonal planes here. Have I got a new pen? Yeah, it was a pretty rare occasion. Both of my pens died on the same day. So, uh, but now I got another one. All right, so that's the graphical interpretation. So we can summarize this by saying that the rate of change of F in the direction of U is the slope of the tangent line at the point A, B, F of A, B. And why is the point written like this? Well, this is an X value, this is a Y value, and then this is a Z value. We have Z is F of X, Y right here. Um, so this is the slope of the tangent line at here of the curve C. So I'm calling this curve right here C, the intersection of our surface with this plane right here. All right, so let's see here. So that's kind of the graphical interpretation of the directional derivative uh, in the direction of U at AB. Um, now remember this, I guess this picture is slightly misleading because it kind of looks like the vector pointing to this point is pointing in the same direction as U, but we could have drawn this picture over here. So our point could have been here, but then our direction could have pointed maybe that way. So this U vector does not have to be the same or even a multiple of this AB right here. So I just wanna emphasize that because I don't think this picture does a good enough job at emphasizing that. So U does not have to be the vector AB or even a multiple of it. I just wanna be clear about that. All right. So now let's say we wanted to compute one of these. Now, so far we've only seen a limit definition of the derivative and I know how you guys probably feel about that. We're not really enthusiastic about using the limit definition of the derivative to actually go and compute them. I mean, we could, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that if we want to do it, uh, but there's certainly got to be an easier way to do it. So suppose that F is a differentiable function, meaning it has a well-defined tangent plane and its partial derivatives are, exist. And th th this means that F has a directional derivative in the direction of any unit vector and moreover, we have a nice formula for this directional derivative. And the formula is going to be the following. Partial F partial X at the point AB times U1 plus partial F partial Y at that point times U2 right here. All right, now what this effectively is is we're weighting the partial derivatives. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say our vector mostly goes in the x direction, right? That means that u1 will be large relative to u2. And so that means we're mostly gonna be counting partial f partial x as opposed to partial f partial y since we're mostly moving in the x direction right here. Uh, this is a u, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. Let me zoom in tip here. Yeah, that's a little u hat. It's the direction that our derivative is going in. Okay, so let's actually uh, have an example of this. So find the direction, uh, the directional derivative of f of x, y is x squared plus x, y um, at the point one, two in the direction here. Oh, is this similar to differentials? Those are weighted too, I think. Yes, absolutely. So we're in, with differentials, we weighted the differential by how much we were changing in that direction. This is exactly the same thing. If we're moving a lot in this direction, this is gonna be bigger. If we're moving a lot in this direction, this will consequently be bigger. So that's, that's a good intuition. All right. So find the directional derivative here. All right, well, let's use the formula we just found. So we have partial F, partial X. Let's see, I'm gonna get two X here. And then the derivative of X times Y well, X is the variable now, Y is the constant. So the derivative of the variable times the constant is the constant. So we have two X plus Y. Meanwhile, partial F partial Y, what's that going to be? Well, the derivative of this will be zero and the derivative of this will flip the roles of X and Y. We're just gonna get an X out of that. Okay, 
So then at the point one, two, what are these gonna be? Well, let's say I plug in one for X and get one times two is two, plug in two for Y, that's gonna end up giving me four. And then I just plug in one for X here and get one right here. All right. So let's see here. Now we're ready to um, use the formula here. So we have the directional derivative of our function in the direction of u hat right here. So that's going to be the x partial derivative, which we found to be four, times u1, which is one over root two. Then we have the partial derivative in the y direction, which we found to be one. I guess I shouldn't say a, b. I should probably say the specific point, uh, one, two. Um, and then we have one here, and then we have also one over root two. So it seems like this direction right here is, treat, is going equally in the x and y direction. So it's kind of going um, diagonally here. All right. So then we just add these together. Four plus one times one over root two is five over root two. So this is going to be our rate of change right here. Um, what if u has three dimensions? Then it would work exactly the same way. So we'd have partial f, partial x, u1, partial f, partial y, u2, and then partial f, partial z, u3. It works the same way, even if you up the number of dimensions that you're using as an input. All right, so there we go. We have a nice little example right there. Um, now, sometimes what may happen, so we were fortunate with this example um, in that this was already a unit vector. If we take the magnitude of this, we end up getting one for that. But in the future, may, they may not be so kind to you. They may actually give you um, a vector. They say wanna, they want to have the directional derivative in the direction of a vector, but then the vector that they give you is not necessarily a unit vector. All right. Oh, yeah, I, I see some questions on what this actually means. This is the rate of change of f of x, y at 1, 2 in the direction of 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. That's the significance of this. So if we move, if we start at the point 1, 2 and we move in this direction, our rate of change is going to be 5 over root 2, and we're going to be increasing. All right. Does this create a single line? Yeah, that's back to the picture uh, back here. So we're effectively finding the slope of a tangent line. And we're finding the slope of the tangent line that's in the intersection of the plane that has our U right here. All right. So yeah, like I was saying, sometimes though they want us to do the directional derivative in the direction of a vector, but then the vector they give us is not a unit vector. But Fortunately, that has an easy fix. All we need to do is we need to just scale the vector. So it is a unit vector. All right, so let's take a look at an example of that. Find the directional derivative of this function at the point one, four in the direction of one, negative one. All right, well, first things first, let's get our partial derivatives going here. Partial f, partial x. Let's see here. So we leave the y squared alone and we take the derivative of ln of x, and then we get one over x. All right, then we have partial f partial y, and I just take the derivative of y squared and leave natural log alone, and so we end up getting this. All right, now we're doing this at the point one four, so let's go ahead and plug in those numbers. So I plug four into the y squared and get 16. I plug one in for my x, <coughs> excuse me, I need a drink. Oh, sorry about that. All right. So I have 16 on the top, one on the bottom, and that ends up giving me 16. All right, now I'm gonna plug in one four into here. So I have two, and then I have ln of four right there. So those are going to be my partial derivatives at that point. Okay, now we wanna do this in the direction of one negative one. So let's call this u, but I'm not gonna put a hat on it because I don't think the magnitude of this 
is going to be. Um, what's up, sir? Um, yeah, what's up? Oh, uh, what did I fixed the round, didn't I? Ah, okay. Whoops. Thank you for catching that. So the four goes here, and then the one goes in the natural log. I got them flipped around. So I have eight ln of one, and actually that ends up being zero. So it's inevitably it's going to uh, end up being irrelevant what our um, y component is because it's not going to be changing in that direction. But anyways, let's figure out what um, the magnitude of u is. So this is our vector we want to find the derivative in the direction of. The magnitude of u is the square root of one squared plus negative one squared or root two. So in order to turn this into a u hat, I need to divide this vector by root two right here. All right, so that's gonna end up giving me one over root two, negative one over root two. So this is really what I'm gonna be using in my directional derivative calculation. All right, so du hat f of a, b. Oh, I keep writing a, b when we have a specific number. Or a specific point. So I have du hat, and we're at the point one four. So what is this going to be? It's going to be sixteen times one over root two, and then we're going to add zero times negative one over root two, because our partial derivative with respect to y is zero. So at this point, it doesn't seem like we're changing in the y direction. So this is irrelevant. So we just end up with 16 over root two as our directional derivative. And remember, I wanna emphasize this again, the interpretation of this number is the rate of change of f of x, y at the point one four if we move in the direction one over root two, negative one over root two. So we move a little bit in the x direction and then a negative amount in the y direction right here. All right. Why don't we have to rationalize the denominator? You never really have to rationalize the denominator. There, there's two things that high school teachers always get wrong when they, they teach students. And one is that, oh, you can't have a, a square root in the denominator. There's absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. There's absolutely no issue with dividing by a radical number here. Um, so that, that's, it's totally fine to leave your answer like this. Um, oh, okay, so they want, oh, I see. So some of the, the multiple choice answers look like this. Okay, well, we can, we can simplify it then. But I'll, I'll be real with you. There's no actual reason why we need to do this. So if I multiply the top and bottom by root two, uh, then I have 16 root two over two, AKA eight root two. So that's another way of writing this answer. All right, let's see, we got that. Yeah, the interesting thing about this, so yes, yeah, so I see an interesting comment there. Even though we're actually moving in the Y direction, like this part isn't zero, we're moving in the Y direction, all of our change is happening because of our motion in the X direction. Because partial F partial Y is zero, so our motion in the Y direction is contributing nothing to the change of this function right here. All right. Dr. Manley. Uh, yeah, what's up? Uh, I was actually watching like a video about why you rationalize it. It's like, for example, square root of two is 1.4, like one divided by like 1.4 is like not easy to do, but 1.4 divided by two, like square root of two over two is like really easy to do by hand. So that's like where it started. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's certainly a historical basis of doing it, but I, I'm just saying in theory, like there's nothing wrong uh, with a number like this. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right for um, uh, for the past, but thankfully we're living in uh, 2021 here. We could we could just <laughs> we just go on the calculator if we want to get the exact decimal. But yeah, that's absolutely true. All right. Anyways, back to this here. We could also write any unit vector uh, u as cosine of theta sine of theta where theta is the angle the unit vector makes with the positive x axis here. Um, so that means that our du hat f of x, y could be written as partial f partial x cosine of theta plus partial f partial y sine of theta. Well, remember, theta is the angle that the unit vector makes with 
the positive x-axis right here. And the reason why we can do this, here's a little mini picture, is let's say we have a u in this direction, right? This is our direction vector right here. Um, so the magnitude of this vector, since it's a unit vector, is one. Now, if we ever have a radius of one, we're extending out one, then the x component for that will be cosine of theta, and then the vertical part will be sine of theta right here. All right. Now, this, this interpretation is going to be important in a, in a moment here. Let's see. All right, we can write the computational formula for the directional derivative as a dot product. So notice that we have an x component times an x component, right? This is something to do with x times something to do with x right here. And then we have something with, that has to do with y, the partial derivative with respect to y, times something that had to do with y right here. That certainly seems like a dot product uh, to me here, if we multiply the x components together and the y components. Now, what is this the dot product of? Well, I think that in the second component here, I think it's pretty clear what that is. We have u1 as our x here for the second vector, and then u2 is our y. And what are we dotting this with? Well, we're dotting it with the vector that's made up of partial f, partial x, and then partial f, partial y. So we're kind of making a new vector, and for each component, we're putting the derivative of f in that direction right here. All right, now this, this vector in particular, this, this vector that's made out of the, uh, the partial derivatives right here, um, this is such a common vector that it actually has a specific name. This vector right here is called the gradient of f, and it's denoted by this uh, upside down triangle right here. So if you put this upside down triangle in front of a function, what that's indicating is you want to do the partial derivative of it with respect to x, and then the partial derivative of it with respect to y, and turn that into a vector here. It's not quite delta. Delta would be a triangle like, like that. Uh, if I remember right, I think maybe this is called nabla or something like that. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, a lot of people pronounce it as grad for, for gradient. Uh, that's another common name that you're going to hear. This, yeah, the delta, this is called a Laplacian, and that's something different. Uh, these, these bros are named up, uh, made up. Yeah, these, these names are, yeah, they kind of seem made up. I don't think it's a Greek letter. Maybe it's a Greek letter. I have no idea. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, let's, let's go ahead and uh, actually compute this. I do know how to compute the thing, thankfully. Um, so let's go ahead and compute um, the gradient of f, and then the gradient of f at a particular point right here. So let's see, the gradient of f. Um, now it's assumed that the gradient is a vector, so it's, it's technically unnecessary to write the little vector symbol on top, but I'm gonna write it maybe the first time we do this, just to remind ourselves that the gradient will always be a vector. So even though there's not the little vector symbol up there, we need to remember that the gradient is always going to be a vector here. Okay, so the gradient here, partial f, partial x. So let's compute that. The derivative of natural log of something is one over that something. And then we multiply by the x derivative of the inside, but the x derivative of this inside is just one. So we don't need to worry too much about that. Now we do the derivative of this with respect to y. So we do one over, x plus sine of y, and then we do the y derivative of this, and that does actually have something non-trivial. It's cosine of y. All right, so there we are. There is our gradient for this function. All right. And then now we want to do this at the point one zero. Okay, well, let's see what that's going to be. So I have one over one plus sine of zero, which is zero, so this is gonna be one. And then now I'm gonna plug in one and zero into here. Cosine of zero will be one. Sine of zero will be zero and X is one. So we end up getting one, one for our gradient right here. 
Okay, now at this point you might be like, okay, well, so what? This is just like a different way of writing what we were already doing. What's the significance of the gradient? And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Why do we care about this? Why does it have its own, uh, albeit weird name? Um, before we do that, I just wanna mention that the gradient works the same way. And actually everything that we've talked about today works the same way for functions that have more than two variables as input. So for example, if we have W is F of X, Y, and Z, um, then the gradient of this will just be the X component of the derivative here, the partial derivative with respect to Y here. And then since Z is now a variable, we have partial F partial Z right here. So it kind of just ends up um, generalizing this uh, just a bit more. What would this look like on a graph? Um, so even if, well, we can't really draw a, uh, a graph with four variables total, at least not on paper, um, but this would actually still be the slope, the directional derivative would still be the slope of a tangent line, because you would fix three coordinates and then, or sorry, you would fix two coordinates and then you would find the slope of the tangent line in that direction. So it'd still be the slope of a tangent line, even if you do, up the dimension. And no matter, how, no matter how many dimensions you are, it will always be the slope of the tangent line, these directional derivatives. All right. So let's see an example of this. Let's try to compute the gradient if we have three variables. And it's not entirely far-fetched to have three variables in an application. Like for example, you could have the temperature of some three-dimensional room where you represent the coordinates of the room as x, y, and z. And then your fourth variable t would be the temperature at that location. So it's not entirely far-fetched to have something like this right here. All right, so let's go ahead and do the gradient here. So the gradient of this function, let's see. Let's do the x derivative of this. So we have e to the x times something here, and this yz is a constant. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply down by the constant yz, and then we keep the exponential. Then the x derivative of all of this right here is just gonna be one because the x derivative of this is one and then we have zero for those. Now, one interesting thing about this, this function is very symmetric with respect to x, y, and z, right? Like I could flip any two of the variables, like let's say I traded places with x and y here and the function would be exactly the same. Now that's good news when we're computing partial derivatives because that means that all of our partial derivatives will essentially look the same. So if you guys had to guess without thinking too hard, what do you guys think the partial derivative with respect to y is going to be here? They want to kind of just see what it might be by symmetry of this function. Yeah, replace y with x, that's right. Yeah, so instead of yz here, we're gonna have xz e to the x, y, z, and then also plus one, because this time we're taking the derivative of y and then these would be zero. And then finally, we have the last combination. We have x, y, e to the x, y, z, and that's also going to be plus one right here. So when you see that your function is very symmetric, meaning you can flip any two of the variables and it's still the same function, you could do the same thing with the partial derivative. All right, so we have this. Now we want to do this at the point two, one, zero. So let's do that. All right, let's see here. So I know my Z is going to be zero right here. What, what does the gradient fundamentally represent again? Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, sorry, I, I started talking about that, but then I forgot that we had this page on multivariables. I'll talk about that on the next page. Um, anyways. So we have um, z is zero here, meaning all of that's gonna be zero. And then we have plus one. And then the same thing occurs here. We have z is zero, meaning all of that will be zero. And we have one. And then finally, we don't have a z here. So we have two times one is two, and then e to the two times one times zero. So this is e to the zero, which is one. And then we have two times one is two. And then plus another one will give us three right here. Okay, so this is our gradient here. And now we wanna know the directional derivative of F at the point two, one, zero in the direction of one negative one root two. Now let's see here, is one negative one root two uh, a unit vector? 
Is it already unit vector? Is that magnitude one? <laughs> yeah, that's a vehement no from the, the chat here. Yeah, no, it's certainly not a unit vector. So what we need to do is we need to um, turn it into a unit vector. So the magnitude of this vector is the square root of one squared plus negative one squared plus root two squared. All right, so we have one plus one plus root two squared is four. So this is two. This vector has magnitude two. This means that u hat, the vector we're actually going to use is one half, negative one half, and then root two over two right here. So what we wanna do is we wanna find the directional derivative of f at the point two one zero in this direction. And that will be the gradient at that point dotted with the direction vector. Okay, so when we dot these together, we have one times a half is a half. We have one times negative a half is negative a half. So these will actually cancel. And then we have three times root two over two will just be, well, three times root two over two. And there we go. So there is our directional derivative here. And one more time, I'm gonna write out the interpretation of this. So the rate of change of f of x, y, z at the point two, one, zero while moving in the direction, um, let's see, one, what was it, one half, negative one half, root two over two is three root two over two. Right here. So that's that's the interpretation of what we just found. If we're at this point and we're considering moving in this direction, this is how much we're going. This is what our rate of change is going to be. In that direction. Okay. Now we can get to the interpretation of the gradient. So, in addition to being a vector, kind of like a collection of all the partial derivatives, uh, what else is it going to be? Um, well, let's take a look here. So, um, the gradient is going to tell us in what direction the derivative is the greatest value and the smallest value. So if we wanna have our greatest amount of change and then our smallest amount of change, uh, we should look in the direction of the gradient. So to answer the question that just appeared, um, we could use it to do what we just learned earlier in the class, but it turns out that there's more to the gradient than just that. All right, so let's take a look here. So let's say we wanna find out the magnitude of our rate of change, right? We wanna find the biggest amount of change possible. Which way is that going to be? Well, let's see here. The magnitude of this will be the magnitude of this dot product. Well, let's see here. So if we have a dot product, we know what that's gonna equal. It's gonna be the absolute value or wait, sorry, this doesn't need to be an absolute value. This dot, I'm just gonna do it over here. This dot product here is equal to the magnitude of the gradient times the magnitude of u hat times cosine of the angle between them right here. All right, now let's see here. What is the magnitude of u hat? going to be? It's going to be one, right? Because it's a unit vector. So this is really saying the same thing as the magnitude of our gradient times cosine of theta. All right. Now let's see here. And what does this theta mean in this context? Theta is the angle between the direction of the gradient and u hat. So this is the direction of whatever direction the gradient is pointing in, and then we have u hat. This is the angle uh, between those right here. Where did the cosine come from? It comes from what the dot product is. The dot product of two things is the absolute value of each one or the magnitude of each one times cosine. All right, now let's see here. So that means that, um, well, let's think about cosine for a moment. What's the biggest value that cosine can attain? 
it's one, right? So that means that if I take this, I can set this less than or equal to the magnitude of my gradient times one. Uh, cosine theta. Okay, now on the other hand, the lowest value the cosine can attain is negative one. And remember, this is my directional derivative here. This was what we had in the beginning. So this is saying that my directional derivative can at most be the magnitude of the gradient. That's the biggest it can be. And note that this happens when cosine is equal to one. So this happens when cosine of theta is equal to one. If cosine of theta is equal to one, then what's the angle between my gradient and the direction we're moving? In? It's zero, right? This means that we are moving in the direction of the gradient. Okay, let's let's move over to the other side here. So we also saw that this is has to be greater than the negative of the gradient. So the gradient is also a lower bound on how much we could be decreasing by. And what angle uh, makes cosine be negative one? It's going to be pi, right, or 180 degrees. So cosine theta is negative one, meaning that we're going to have uh, an angle of pi or 180, whatever you like. And that means that we're going in exactly the opposite direction as the gradient. Okay, so what's the conclusion here? The conclusion is that the gradient points by default in the direction of steepest descent. Whatever direction the gradient is pointing in, it's pointing in the direction that you can increase the most in if you choose to move in that direction. And it's also, if you, if you choose to totally defy the gradient and go exactly the other way, then you'll be descending as fast as possible. So the gradient points in the direction of the steepest ascent. So that's what we can kind of conclude here. And that's the greater significance of the gradient rather than just a way to keep track of partial derivatives. Okay, and then this is kind of summarized by this um, theorem on the next page. So let f be differentiable at this point, and let's say the gradient isn't zero, then f has a maximum rate of increase at p in the direction of the gradient. The rate of change in this direction is the absolute value of the gradient, which was what we saw up here. Our dark directional derivative will be this if our theta is equal to zero. And in the similar way, we have our maximum rate of decrease in the direction of negative the gradient. And the rate of change in that direction will be negative the absolute value of the gradient. And that's what we saw on the other end of this inequality right here. All right. One more piece of information that's kind of interesting is that the rate of change uh, in the direction, in a direction will be zero if that direction is orthogonal to the gradient, uh, the gradient's direction. Now, does anyone know why? that might be the case. Why would we, oh, oops, I, I didn't move this up on it, sorry. Why do you guys think this would be true? And as a hint, take a look at this right here. So the dot product would be zero when our cosine of theta is 90, that's right. So remember our dot product earlier is the gradient times cosine of theta. And how could this be zero? Well, it could be zero when cosine is zero. That's why they actually in the theorem require the gradient to not be zero. So cosine has to be. And if we look at cosine of 90 degrees, that's gonna make this be zero right here. And 90 degrees is going to be orthogonal. So that's the reasoning for this final piece of information right here. All right, so let's put this, uh, let's put this fact into use right here. Um, so for this function, Find the unit vectors which give the steepest ascent and descent um, at the point one, negative one. All right, well, that definitely requires us to find our gradient here. Is this going really slowly? Is, is this recording, is, is my internet bad? Uh-oh. 
point um like your voice is uh, your voice is uh, pretty good but like the paper it's moving really weird oh sorry about that well most most of what we wanted was on this page hopefully hopefully it's a little bit better now yeah sorry guys oh what's going on with zoom yeah. anyways let, let's go ahead and take a look at uh this right here all right so we need to know the gradient of our function right here okay so let's go ahead and figure out what this is so we need to do the x derivative yeah the gradient is the x derivative in the first component and the y derivative in the second component so our x derivative here, if we have e raised to the something, then the derivative of this will be that same thing times the derivative of the inside here. And the x derivative of the inside ends up being 2x. Then we apply the same reasoning and we take the y derivative. So we have a copy of the original here. And then we multiply by the y derivative of the inside, but that's just going to be 1. Okay, so here is our gradient. Now we want to find the direction of steepest ascent and descent at one negative one. So that implies we need to find the gradient at one negative one. All right, let's see here. So if I plug one and negative one in, I have two times one, and then this will be e to the one and then minus one. So this will be e to the zero, uh, which is one. And then we have two times one here is two. And then here, we have the same exponent here. So this is e to the zero, which is one, and then times one is one. So the gradient at that point is two, one. Now let's see, what's the magnitude of the gradient here? So that's gonna be the square root of two squared plus one squared, which is root five. So if we wanna know what direction that we have steepest, uh, ascent will be the direction two over root five and then one over root five. It's gonna be in that direction right here. And then for descent, you can probably guess what this is going to be here. It's just going to be the negative of this. It's gonna be in completely the opposite direction. Intuitively, you can kind of think of it like this. Like, let's say you're on some kind of like mountain or slope or something like that, and you find the direction of steepest ascent. That's you just looking up the slope, and then all you have to do to find the steepest descent is just simply turn around and look down the very same slope that you were looking at earlier. That's exactly what's going on with this right here. Um, professor? Uh, yeah, what's up? Uh, why did we change them into unit vectors when we're doing the direction? Um, because direction, we, we just want to specify the direction. We don't really care in this one about the uh, the magnitude here. So when they say they want to know a direction, I always give them a, a unit vector. We don't really care about size. All right. Now let's see here. All right. Oh yeah, this is the electricity stuff that we were talking about earlier. So suppose that over a region of space, the electric potential is given by V of X, Y, Z is four X squared minus three X, Y plus X, Y, Z right here. Well, actually Samuel has a good comment um, right here. So the max rate of increase is square root of five. Absolutely, whatever the magnitude of the gradient is going to be, it's going to be um, the maximum rate of change in any direction. All right. So let's see here. We want to find the rate of change of the potential at the point one, one, zero in this direction. All right, so this is just finding the directional derivative here. All right, well, we can do that by finding the gradient of V and then dotting it with a unit vector in this direction right here. All right, so the gradient of this, let's see, let's do the X derivative. We have eight X and then we take the X derivative of this minus 3y, we take the x derivative of this, and we have y times z. Next, we do the y derivative. So we take the y derivative of this and get zero. We take the y derivative of this right here and get negative 3x. 
And we take the y derivative of this and get x times z. And for the final component, we take the z derivative of everything, which will be zero here, zero here. And then we take the z component of this, or the z derivative of this, excuse me, and we get x, y. All right, there is our gradient in general. And now we want to find this gradient at this point here. The gradient at that point, one, one, zero. Let's see. Um, so if I plug one in here, I get eight. If I plug one in here, I get minus three. So this is five. And then this will be zero because Z is zero. So I get five there. Um, let's see, what is this gonna be? Well, Z is zero again. So it looks like I'm gonna get negative three here. All right. And then for the last part, we have X times Y. Well, that's one times one will be one right here. Okay, so there is our gradient. And then now we need a unit vector in this direction. So if this is the direction we wanna go in, or we wanna go in the direction of this, then our unit vector, let's see, uh, what's the magnitude of this gonna be? Can you guys see what the magnitude of this is? Square root of three, that's right. So, the unit vector is where we just divide everything by the square root of three. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at here. We wanna know the directional derivative in the direction of u at the point one, one, zero, which will be the gradient at that point dotted with the direction vector. All right, let's see. So we're going to get five over root three here. We're going to get negative three over root three here. And then we're going to get negative one over root three here. Okay, so five minus three minus one is going to be one over root three. Or if you want to rationalize that denominator, we end up getting root three over three right here. All right, so this is the amount, the rate of change. This is the interpretation. This is the rate of change of this potential at that point in this direction. All right, let's continue here. In which direction does V change most rapidly at P? Okay, well, we wanna find the greatest rate of change and what direction is that going to be in? What did we just talk about here? going to be in the direction of, I just spent a decent bit talking about this. It's gonna be the gradient, that's right. So we need to find the direction of the gradient. All right, well, the gradient here is five, negative three, one. Um, so I guess I'll change this into a unit vector since I really wanted to just specify direction. I don't care about in this part, I don't care about the size of the gradient, but I will for the next part. The magnitude of this is the square root of 25 plus negative three squared, which is nine, um, plus one squared. So this is the square root of 34. So the direction vector, the direction of steepest ascent will be five over root 34, negative three over root 34 and, oh, 35. You're right, that's 35. Sorry about that. And then one over root 35. 35, there we go. And what is the maximum rate of change at P? Well, that's simply the magnitude of our gradient, which we just computed to be not root 34, but root 35. So the maximum rate of change that we could possibly achieve at the point one, one, zero is going to be uh, root 35. Uh, we can't find any direction to change more than this. And we can't find any direction to lose more of our value than root 35. All right, let's see here. Oh, perfect timing. That's, that's about it for today. Um, yeah, so I think if I remember correctly, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the gradient next time. This is going to be a very important, um, a very important quantity for us here. So uh, anyways, I will see you guys.
next time.